There's a difference between capital B Bitcoin and lowercase b Bitcoins. And so Bitcoins with a lowercase b is what trades, has value, it's sort of like a currency. Whereas capital B uh, Bitcoin, which is really the Bitcoin network or Bitcoin protocol or the blockchain, is where Bitcoins derive their value from. So there are 21 million Bitcoins that can ever exist that are really almost like real estate on the Bitcoin protocol. And so the difference between the two is an important concept and uh, understanding the difference is what will also allow you to understand why lowercase b actually has value. The value of Bitcoins is derived from the capital B Bitcoin network, or this blockchain. And so uh, they are a scarce place on a very valuable ledger. And so in order to understand uh, what this capital B is, we should maybe take a step back and think of, okay, this is a distributed, trustless public ledger or a consensus ledger system. And this is a, a, a very new technology and people often refer to it as the blockchain. And I think we've talked about this uh, before. And what it does um, is allow you to ledger assets in an entirely new way. And so that, the power of that ledger is where you then derive the value of a spot on that ledger, which is what Bitcoin's lowercase b are representing. And so and this is a pretty important concept because you can often think of Bitcoins as simply a, a piece of currency. And Sure, they're scarce, but it's just a currency and it's not backed by anything. Whereas if you think about it as a spot on a ledger, you realize that it's perhaps more akin to an asset or a piece of real estate of which there is a finite amount. And the reason why you would want to own that real estate uh, is because the ledger is powerful enough, the blockchain or the Bitcoin protocol is powerful enough to do a whole variety of different things that can ultimately change the financial system because it's a fundamental financial ledgering innovation. All right, so we just touched on a little bit. The blockchain is a distributed, trustless public ledger. And so let's just unpack that a little bit and think about what it means. It's kind of a mouthful and uh, it's not necessarily intuitive. Uh, it's certainly not intuitive in that it's different from the way we really ledgered things in the past. And so it's distributed very much like the World Wide Web in that it's um, uh, not one centralized place. It's public, and this is a really interesting facet because every transaction that happens on the network in the past and that's happening currently is known to everybody. So it's, it's a public piece of information, very transparent. And it's consensus, or, or sometimes called trustless, because you don't need to trust any one single point because it's a whole consensus system where everyone is agreeing on what's happened. And so that creates a lot of resiliency. So the combination of all three of those things is, a, is, a, is what is ultimately allowing um, the blockchain to have value. Because that innovation in ledgering is very powerful. And the spots are very few. And so you could see, therefore, why Bitcoins could appreciate in value. Um, and certainly why the blockchain itself is ultimately very valuable. And so if you thought about right now, there's about $5 billion of market cap in the Bitcoin world. Now, um, if we make the assumption that this is a very powerful uh, a ledgering system, um, it, it can certainly replace a whole variety of other ledgering systems that we currently use that have significantly more value, right? So, uh, some common ways of thinking about uh, the blockchain are as a payment system like Visa or MasterCard or Western Union or MoneyGram. Now that's a very simple payment system. It's not all that advanced and you know we can touch upon uh, far more sophisticated ways of using the blockchain. But that uh, payment system method alone there is well north of 500 billion dollars of market cap of companies that are basically doing uh, various types of simple ledgering. And uh, the blockchain maybe is not a perfect replacement for it, but it gives you some example of how important this could be. And ultimately, therefore, how much market cap or what, how much value could be in the lowercase b bitcoins.
This trustless concept or this consensus ledgering concept is really important because uh, in the current banking system, so maybe we take a step back and think about how is this different from what we're used to. And so in the current banking system, you're really talking about a, um, a trusted system. And what that means is you have to trust another counterparty in which there is something opaque going on. You don't know what is on their books. And maybe you're not just trusting that counterparty. You may be ultimately trusting a central bank. But however you do it, you're trusting uh, really um, a single entity or a single group of entities. Whereas in the Bitcoin system, with the Bitcoin protocol, because it's like the World Wide Web, everyone has agreed to join the network. And so everyone is verifying transactions. And that verification process is where you come up with this consensus idea. And it's a fundamental innovation to be able to have a consensus agreement on what's on a ledger. And it's something that cryptographers and computer programmers and uh, mathematicians have been working on for a very long time. So this is not like something that just came out of the blue, even though it might feel like that to us as kind of laymen, or at least to myself, uh, kind of a layman when it comes to cryptographic technology. But it's really something that has been uh, been worked at for quite a long time. And that is one of the very key features, aside from the fact that this is a public system, the fact that it's, cons it's a consensus and trustless. You don't need to worry whether or not I can trust you know, one person or another. It's about everyone agreeing at the same time. And uh, that's a very, very powerful tool. So if you want to think about how this works on a functional basis, so really you have a worldwide network of computers that have come together and have the same uh, open source computer code they've, down they've downloaded and are running. And by doing that, everyone is able to communicate with each other and come to a consensus on what is a true transaction. And so you can also have some uh, anonymity in your transactions, though, not, not, though certainly not perfect anonymity, because you would hold kind of a, a private key as someone who owns Bitcoins, and you also hold a public key. And a public key would be analogous to holding the, uh, or having the lock on their, your front door. Everyone can see that there's a front door lock, but no one has the key to it. You happen to have the key. And so you're able to unlock the door, and you can walk in, and you can see, OK, in this, to stretch the analogy, OK, there is my 30 Bitcoin is inside that house. And so in the same way, that's how everyone is functioning on the network, by having a public key that everyone is able to see and a private key that you alone hold. And when you make a transaction, you're sending something from your, you're enabling the transaction with your private key, but you're sending it from your public key, and you send it to someone else's public key. That's a very simplified way of describing it, but by sending things from public to public key, you're able to keep track of it in a trustless public consensus way, whereas you still preserve your control because you hold the private key. And it would work just the exact same way if you were to receive bitcoins. So if someone was to say, send bitcoins to you, they would send it to your public address, but no one else can access those unless they happen to have your private key. And how you store these private keys is something that a lot of people are working on. There are multi-signature technologies that would kind of work similar to escrow. It would be a conventional way of thinking about it, though a little bit different. You could just hold the key yourself. And you, know, you have to trust that you're not going to lose your key. Uh, because uh, to even stress the analogy more, there is no locksmith who can come and break into this, uh, into this lock if you lose the key. So it's very important that you don't lose it. Uh, one of the important features is that no one can break into the lock. The downside is that if you lose the key to the lock, you're going to lose what's inside of it. And so um, any, at any rate, this is a, a very important way of allowing the network to function in a way that is different from how the current financial system is functioning. And so we were talking a little bit about the blockchain. The blockchain is what keeps track of all these transactions that are happening. 
from one public key to another public key, and then back and forth. And then, even more importantly, you're not just keeping track of these transactions, which might be 30 bitcoins to grant for $1,000 and vice versa. It could also be sending a very small fraction of a bitcoin from someone to another person. Now that's a transaction and it's kept in the ledger. But you can even do something more than that. You can take a very small fraction of a bitcoin and because it's digital, it might only be a small fraction of a bitcoin, but you can attach say, for instance, your title to your house, or to a car, or to copyrights. And we can talk about this a little bit more, but what you're really doing now is you're able to move something on a tiny fraction of a Bitcoin to someone else. And the ledger will keep track of that because it's this public key that's showing people where things are moving, which is really where this, the power of this ledger starts to get logarithmically better than the current ledgering system that we're all very familiar with, with banks moving assets amongst themselves. So this is, a, this is really very exciting stuff. And I think that we're just scratching the surface of what we can use it for. In some ways, I describe the blockchain as an information authentication system. Because you don't just have to move financial value. On a fraction of a Bitcoin, you could put your uh, graduation records, your birth certificate. Uh, you could put your uh, voting records. You could put anything you want uh, that you would like to make sure is authenticated on the Bitcoin system. And so uh, that's a, you know, on a first principles basis, I think a totally different system than what we've ever been used to and one we're just scratching the surface of. So we've talked a little bit about how the blockchain is different from the current financial system, but we should probably develop that a little bit more. Um, the first point is, and this sounds somewhat melodramatic, the current financial system, going all the way back to the Italian Renaissance, has been a private, trusted, centralized ledger system. And so, just to review again what that would be, uh, unpack it a little, private, because it's controlled by somebody, it's um, centralized in that it's going to be one or a single group of parties that control this private ledger. And um, it's, it has to be trusted because you have to trust these parties to do it right. And so that has been a great system. It's gotten us very far. But in some ways, we've reached a logical conclusion of it in terms of what, how capable it is and how powerful it is. And so the blockchain really is an evolutionary way of moving forward, in my opinion. And so it's different in that you have all of those limitations no longer apply. You can move a whole variety of things on a more powerful ledger system. And uh, this is not necessarily intuitive because we're so used to thinking about moving financial information and doing financial transactions in a certain way. The, one of some of the key advantages that result from having this different ledgering system is that you can now do a variety of more powerful things. So if you thought about uh, currency in a, in a very simple way, is it the payment system? And it, that's, I think, very clear to people. As Visa MasterCard is a payment system or Western Union and MoneyGram, it's a remittance system that's kind of like a payment system. And so if you were to think about uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain, a simple use case and a very obvious use case is to use it as a payment system. But really, you can do a lot more than that. And so this is where I think it gets less intuitive but also very interesting. And so what ha can happen is you can take a fraction of a Bitcoin. So I could send one whole Bitcoin for the price is say $380 or something, or f we'll make it $400. I can send it for $400, that's very intuitive. We understand dollars for Bitcoins. But if you took a small fraction of a Bitcoin, it goes to eight decimal places, so you could take 0 .00001 Bitcoin. It's practically worthless, uh, certainly at these current prices, and you could transfer it to somebody. Now that's fine. The ledger will keep track of whether I send one Bitcoin, I send 1,000 Bitcoins, or I send 0 .001 Bitcoins. 
and it keeps track in a public way from one public address to another public address. You can move however many amount of Bitcoins you want. But what you can do is take that basically almost nearly worthless piece of a Bitcoin or fraction of a Bitcoin and you could attach something to it that has a lot of value. So you could attach uh, a contract to a super tanker. You could attach a stock or a bond. You could attach a mortgage title. You could attach almost anything. In fact, you can make uh, smart contracts, uh, derivative contracts that could pay off on various prices of assets. Uh, say if oil goes to uh, $150, you pay somebody X amount of dollars. You can program all of that into a fraction of a Bitcoin and you send it to somebody and the whole ledger knows that this has happened. So I could say, send a mortgage title for myself to another person and I take a fraction of a Bitcoin and you digitally attach your ownership onto this piece of a Bitcoin and then you move it to their public address. They now have control of the mortgage title and the world, whole world knows that this has happened. And so uh, this is a, just a really fundamental innovation in how you can move information and move financial information in a way that's public and also very low friction. And so it, the technology is not necessarily there today to be able to do all of these things, though it's being developed. Some very simple examples for how you could move assets attached to a fraction of Bitcoin are, for instance, gold. This is much easier to do because it's a commodity and it's uh, very fungible. So you can move gold. The owner, I could say I own an ounce of gold and I have the digital ownership of it that I now attach to a fraction of Bitcoin and I send it to somebody else's address. That person who I sent it to now has the fraction of Bitcoin and the ownership of that piece of gold. So this is really new. This is a different way of doing things. Now, but I would also stress that the current financial system has to be intermediated. And this is a, a key concept, though a little tricky. The current financial system has to be intermediated or touch the digital, this digital financial system or the blockchain. And you can't just move real world assets digitally. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. I think we all intuitively recognize that you can't you know, transform uh, an ounce of gold into bits and bytes. You know, it's not going to be ones and zeros no matter how hard you try. Um, this isn't Star Trek where you can just kind of vaporize things, right? So you have to take the custody um, and the clearing of these assets and connect it to what the blockchain is saying just happened. So you may digitally own a piece of gold, but does the person who's physically holding it know that you digitally own it? And so that's where um, there is infrastructure and plumbing that needs to be further developed in order to connect uh, the digital and physical worlds and the current financial system and this newer financial system. Uh, you almost need a translation mechanism, which in some ways is actually what we're building here at ITBIT. talked a little bit about what future use cases could be of the blockchain protocol and I think probably some of the most exciting uses we don't even know about right I mean this is just that kind of a new powerful tool if you think about again you know what blockchain is representing um, we, we've never had the opportunity to use or play around with something like this and it just takes time and the analogy I sometimes use is it's akin to how would you know that Facebook was going to come out of the internet in 1995? You just didn't. You know, it took a while, it took time, and it took ingenuity and entrepreneurship. And so many of those things are in place right now in the, in the Bitcoin world. Just to take an aside, there is over 30,000 programmers that are working on Bitcoin-related uh, projects. Uh, there's been uh, over $300 million of venture capital committed to the Bitcoin world in the last 12 months, which is more than the internet in 1995, and I think I've mentioned this before. So these are really important indications of the kind of entrepreneurship that's being dedicated to the blockchain and also to this blockchain 2.0 concept, which is how do you use, and just colloquially, blockchain 2.0 is how can you use this blockchain, this ledger, in ways that are not just simple payment systems. And I think that you're going to see and you're already seeing, for instance, moving gold, um, 
notary services. There's been some examples of moving ownerships of stocks and bonds, though not all that easily or successfully. It just takes time uh, to, as I mentioned before, connect the current world, uh, the current financial system, with a digital world. And there's all kinds of plumbing that you need to put into place and connections, almost like middleware in a certain way and, or a translation mechanism. So all of that's being done. And I think as we begin to really understand the power of this tool, we'll come up with some very great ways to change the world. And that sounds also you know, somewhat hyperbolic in a way, but I think it will change the world because you're changing the friction with which you move information. Right now, the current financial system, for a whole variety of reasons, uh, depending on your perspective on why it's the case, charges a lot of money to move information around. That's what the financial system is doing. And to be very sure that it's moving the right information around, it can charge anywhere from you know, 2 to 10 percent, or sometimes in many cases more than that. Um, though you can trade stocks and bonds for a lot less. If you wanted to go make a transaction with your debit card or your Visa MasterCard, or you wanted to move money from the United States to Mexico, you, know, you could be paying anywhere from 3 to 10 percent. These are you know, pretty expensive methodologies that are high friction, whereas having a ledger like this, uh, whether it's Bitcoin or something else, well, having an open ledger like this removes that friction. And so you can, you know, already probably begin to come up with new ideas just uh, as you, you sit here and listen to this. It's really hard to say what would be the most impactful, but you can think of a whole variety of ways that it could be really big deal for people uh, every single day. So I always say Bitcoin's not better than Visa MasterCard right now. Um, it's just not. It's not as easy. You'd have to really be a technology enthusiast to be able to use it, and the number of merchants that are accepting it are much fewer. But that's changing over time. Um, but there are certain places where Bitcoin, once uh, fully rolled out, can be significantly better than what exists right now. And so an example would be, for instance, the mortgage industry or the titling industry. So to give an example, uh, there's like $12 billion of market capitalization and title insurance which is you know, well more than double what's in um, the Bitcoin network. And all it's doing is authenticating, title insurance is just authenticating chain of collateral from one person to another to another. Now, it will take some time, but that's exactly what the Bitcoin network does. It's authenticating collateral ownership from one person to another to another. And you, know, you, you could disintermediate in a, in an entire industry like that, for instance. Although it would take time, and there are, it's not quite as simplistic as that. Um, and that's just one piece of the entire mortgage transaction that is so cumbersome, and which really limits the ability for people to be able to make transactions without paying you know, somewhere between 5 to 8% in a mortgage transaction. Or it might be a little bit less, but nonetheless, this is a very high friction way of doing things. And it's because uh, you're still dealing with a chain of collateral system and uh, ownership movement system that's very archaic and doesn't really need to exist the way it, it currently does. And so that's, and that's a pretty huge market. You know, you're talking about, um, I think there's over $10 trillion of mortgages in the United States. Uh, I mean, this is you know a really big deal, and can, if you are able to take uh, the the cost of that process and substantially shrink it, that's a big net benefit to society that can then be used for hopefully far more productive uses. One of the difficulties for Bitcoin right now is ease of use, and ease of use, in tangentially adoption, is what will ultimately allow. Um, wider adoption and wider use of, of blockchain 2.0. So it just needs to be a lot more intuitive, I think, to be able to use Bitcoin. And I don't think that this is a knock on Bitcoin right now or Bitcoin uh, protocol or the blockchain. It, things take time. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, you know, we didn't get to having 
uh, your iPhone 6 when the first cellular phones came out, right? You had these giant bag phones and they were pretty terrible and they were definitely worse than a landline, right? I mean, if you could use a landline, you would use it. You wouldn't use the bag phone in your car. Same thing with uh, the Bitcoin network. I mean, it, you, know, you, you can see how it's going to ultimately be far superior to what we have now, but we're very much in that developmental early adopter stage. And getting from the early adopter phase to something that's more ubiquitous is partly about really changing the way you interface with it so that it's very simple and very easy to use. And that's happening. People are working on that and companies are developing um, these kind of processes and applications and interfaces that will really change um, your technological need for technological knowledge to be able to use it. And so um, it, it's just going to be a process and it doesn't happen overnight. But because it's not here today, to me, isn't a knock on it. That's, that's, not, a, that's not describing a fundamental flaw in the Bitcoin protocol. All right? that's, um, that's describing one of the aesthetic problems that can ultimately be fixed. It's a good question if you, you know, should have one uh, really blockchain protocol or can you have multiple of them? You know, it's like, is there one ring to rule them all, one ring to bind them kind of thing? And I, I, I think that it, it tends to be like the internet where the advantage accrues to one uh, versus the rest. And so, and it seems to be playing out that way even right now. So if you look, uh, I believe 97% of the market capitalization of all altcoins or alternative currencies is in Bitcoin. So something like 650 plus or however many have been created only have 3% of the rest of the market capitalization after you take out Bitcoin. So it's become, I think, clear that um, y there is an increasing advantage to scale and to connectivity. And there are analogies to this. Uh, one of the analogies I, I tend to like is it's kind of like uh, the QWERTY keyboard, where there's no computer that's going to jam up uh, if we have to have the keyboard set up like QWERTY. You know, you could set it up A, B, C, D all the way across. It's totally archaic to be done this way. But the actual cost to shift is far more than this incremental benefit you get from having a different type of keyboard. And so the, there are certain key advantages to some of these other coins for certain compared to Bitcoin. But the actual um, advantage of having everyone using one protocol far outweighs the perhaps linear way that these other protocols might be sl slightly better. Now, if something came along that was logarithmically better, you know, that could be a different story. But certainly nothing is like that right now. What's different about Bitcoin than maybe that analogy I just gave is that it's dynamic. This is a living piece of code. I think over 75% of the code has been rewritten in the past four and a half years in an open source way. But so you're able to take really good ideas from other, um, other innovations and combine them into uh, the blockchain. Now, this is done or into the Bitcoin protocol. But this is done, I think, in a very slow way because it makes sense. Um, it, everyone has come to depend upon uh, the blockchain technology as it is right now. And so uh, continual rewriting is done in a way that gives everybody confidence that this project is continuing to move forward in a very transparent way. And so I think that ultimately um, this uh, criticality in Bitcoin makes it difficult for others to compete, other currencies to compete. And um, it really what you're now beginning to think, see is the way I would think about it uh, for the average person at home is that you have the IP layer of the internet and then uh, applications were built on top of it. And so you have the blockchain or the Bitcoin protocol is the main layer and there are applications that are being built on top of it. And so there are ways to, for instance, have even smarter and more programmable ledgering systems than what Bitcoin represents. 
but they're being built on top of the Bitcoin protocol. And so sometimes these are called uh, colored coins, sometimes they're called side chains, but there seems to be a consensus that the amount of capital that's been put into the transaction processing of the Bitcoin network creates a level of safety and a level of commitment that can't be found anywhere else. And in fact, uh, has actually, that's been proven out, there's been problems with these other uh, alternative currencies. Whereas you don't have that uh, and have never had that in uh, the Bitcoin network. And so rather than just go build a whole new coin, like you could go create a Chad coin or a Grant coin or a Raul coin, rather than do that, just build on top of the existing infrastructure that's in place. And so that's what um, it appears to me is likely to happen. And um, some of these things are actually necessary to enable what we were talking about before, which is this blockchain 2.0 concept, which is that you can start to do very advanced things with the Bitcoin network. Well, in some instances, there are, are things you want to do that are so advanced that the Bitcoin network can't even do it. And so there have been advances that use the Bitcoin network as the foundation and then allow you to go build a separate freestanding building on that same foundation.